Um, I praise the Lord for you being here tonight. We are going to study a little bit, and uh, you have your notes. If you don't have your notes, Tommy Chipman is standing there, and he is ready to get you. So just lift your hand. If, we, if you slip past them, just uh, and Raphael, help him or somebody help him get some of those out to everybody. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at... Um, uh, this great subject of cults and counterfeit gospels. We've uh, already been studying this for the last few weeks. And let's review a little bit. We've said that there, are, that there is the real thing and there are counterfeits. And many of you got to hand, many of you got to hold the, um, the, the, the real and the fake uh, $100 bills last week. How many of you got to see those, got to feel those? Okay, almost everybody in here got to do that. Well, I have to tell you what happened. I have to tell you what happened. Colonel Chuck Samarius and his wonderful wife, Kathleen, came in um, right during the, during the teaching time. And they came in and they sat in the back on this side. Now, the money started on this side. And the money kind of made its way. And finally, it came into the back. And as soon as they walked in and sat down, somebody turned around and handed them two $100 bills. <laughs> and so she looked at that and she said, okay. And she put it in her purse. And somebody was looking at them and said, I cannot believe this. They just stole the pastor's $100 bill and counterfeit $100 bill. And they're like, Okay, so now Chuck, what was the reason you gave for this? I, I mean, remind me. Oh, it was the deposit for the conference room. Yeah, okay. So he he just thought somebody was saying, well, they're giving him the deposit back. Um, so. No, but that was really hysterical. So you never know. You got to watch out with these Baptists. They will just pocket that money so fast it's not funny. But um, it's funny. I, I don't even know how it came out. That. But week one, we looked at the one true gospel. And uh, what did we say about the one true gospel? We said five things. The character of God is very important. Holy, just, loving, and other things we could say. Sinfulness of man. This is a reality. Depraved. No hope within ourselves. Number three, the sufficiency of Christ. Christ is totally sufficient to pay for our sins. And what do we mean by this? How is he sufficient? Because he is perfect. He is God himself. So he comes as the perfect sacrifice. God making the sacrifice for us. Number four, the necessity of faith. So it's not just that Jesus came, but that you have to look to him and believe in him and not yourself or anything or anyone else. So this, this is the gospel threads. And then number five, we see that this is urgent. This is urgent because eternity is at stake. I mean, eternity is coming. I mean, just, I mean, we, we're dealing with sickness and cancer and hearts that fail and accidents that happen. And, and we, we, we recognize that eternity is around the corner for us, whether you're young or whether you're old, in the grand scheme of things, it is coming. And so not only for you that we need to understand the gospel, but also for all of those around us, God has designed it so that we can know the truth and share the truth so they can be set free from their own uh, bondage and descent. So we looked at the one true gospel, and then we looked at the one true God. And the main thing that we looked at the one true God, there's many things that we could look at, but, and look, notice what they are. The Trinity, this is the reality of who God is. And let's read it out one. Number, truth number one is? God is three persons. God is three persons. One in three persons. Number two? Jesus God. Each one of those persons, not each one of us is fully God, but each one of the persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each one of those is fully God. None of those is any less God than the other. Completely, perfectly one, but also completely, beautifully equal. Look at number three. There is one God. One God. So um, it, this isn't three gods. It's not that this is one God out of many that we would reference. This is not just the best God idea. Um, but there is one true God. There is one creator. And he reveals himself in three persons, the three in one. So week number three, we looked at, okay, so we're going to identify some cults. And this is important because there's cults all around us. And there's counterfeit gospels all around us. We've picked out a couple of obvious ones to get us going. 
um, in this, but what is a cult? A cult is, is a group which claim to be in harmony with God, but deny foundational Christian doctrines. And that word foundational is important. In fact, let's think about this. You could put in the word a fundamental doctrine. Foundational or fundamental are very similar in words. The idea is they're the under, they're the, 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 the supporting basis for everything else. Um, and if somebody has said uh, in the past, well, is this a fundamentalist church? Well, what do we mean by that? So help me out. What, what are two possibilities that that can mean? Is this a fundamentalist church? Okay. Did you hear what Jose said? Is it legalistic? The reason is the word fundamentalist got hijacked about 70 years ago by a movement of evangelicalism and, or, and basic Christianity that kind of said, well, in the midst all of, of all of the modernism that is going on, we believe the truth, we believe that through the days of prohibition, of no alcohol, and through other days, they came back and they said, no, we believe the scripture, we believe the Bible is true. And that's true, they were holding on to the gospel, but they also mixed in a pretty fair amount of cultural um, mandates with it. And so evangelicalism took on a, a fundamentalist mentality, and these were people who believed the Bible, who were not, a, they weren't going to go with the culture. That part was good, but before very long, their, their legalism began to take over. And this is going to play into our, our work tonight as we look at this. But before very long, their sets of rules about behavior and their sets of rules about Christian behavior became more prominent than the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The saving knowledge of Jesus Christ got lip service, but what really got the nitty gritty elbow grease was, are you acting like a Christian and are you, um, really, are you really in line with, with the Christian life when it comes to, are you doing the things that Christians are supposed to do and are you not doing the things that Christians aren't supposed to do? And that became more important than even what we would call the emphasis on the grace that is in God. So it became very legalistic about, you better not go to that movie, you better not go to the movie theater, you better not do this, you better not do that, and if you do that, somebody's gonna come over and get you. you know, I mean, it was, the, it was the, a big thing about about certain behaviors, and there were certain ones that were, there were certain sins that were kind of accepted, quite honestly, and there were certain sins that were very much rejected. And so, fundamentalist took on a bad name in that regard because legalism began to rule the day. And some of you came out of traditions that were, that were in bondage to that. Now, would we say that obedience is not important? Would we say that just living, how, you know, living in sin is, is not a big deal? We would never say that. We would always say as a Christian, you just read your Bible, that Jesus said, if you don't obey me, you don't love me. If you love me, you're going to do what I say. Your life is going to show it. And if your life doesn't show it, then it's, obviously that you're, it's obvious that you're not mine. So that's basic Christianity, whatever, call it whatever you want, but that is, that is the basic truth of the Bible. So, but when it comes to the fundamentals of the faith, what are some of the fundamentals of the faith? And if by that we mean not legalistic do's and don'ts, but, but the key beliefs that are absolutely essential to Christian faith based upon the Bible, what are a few fundamentals of the faith. Somebody said it right here. What's that, Colvin? Okay, now that's a good one to start with. And the reason that that's a good one to start with is because you have to have a basis for belief. And, you know, the Reformation, this little German monk and others began to say, well, wait a minute. What is the basis of our belief? Is it the Pope? Is it the councils? Is it church tradition? Is it somebody's indigestion from the night before, you know, and they felt moved by something, you know, what, what, is, what is the foundation of their belief? And the Reformation taught us sola scriptura. Sola scriptura, only scripture, the word of God is by which we base our beliefs. 
So sola scriptura, or only scripture, becomes our foundation. So one of the most important foundations for Christian faith is the word of God, because how else can you know the truth? And so that, that's a key one. What's another fundamental of the faith? We've, Say that again, Michelle. So salvation in Jesus Christ alone. So um, the, the fact that it's not through anything else that we can be saved. What are other fundamentals of the faith? That's, that, that encompasses several of them. What's that? Okay, the virgin birth. That would be a, a fundamental of our faith. And why is that important? Because that points to who Jesus really is, that he's not just a human being. He is from God. The virgin birth is a big deal because it makes very clear that this is not your normal human. This is fully man, but yet also fully God. That's a fundamental of our faith. Any other fundamentals that would be good to mention? Okay, she said he died for our sins. That's right. That Jesus, it's not just salvation in Christ, but more specifically, Christ died on the cross for our sins. He, he died in our place. He paid for our sins. That is a fundamental of the Christian faith. Now, somebody else said something over here. Thank you, Larry. Not only did he die for our sins, but he rose again for our sins. Some people say, well, is the resurrection really that important? <laughs> if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain, Paul said. If Jesus can't save himself in that God raising Jesus from the dead. If God cannot save God, how can he save us? And so the picture is that he indeed is the resurrected Christ, the one who rose, showing us that he has the power to forgive our sins and to save us from our sins and death. So, I mean, let, let's mention another fundamental of the faith, we would say, is the beautiful reality of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is absolutely essential to us. I cannot be a Christian. There's no way I can live the life that God has called me to live without God's Spirit in me doing that. And so, people try to live the Christian life in their own power, and they get exhausted and wiped out and very often burned out and eventually leave. Um, the faith. And it's because God's spirit is not in their spirit giving them the power to obey. I want to encourage you. Say, ooh, pastor, I think I do that sometimes. Well, don't do it. Stop. Let God begin to show you his power in your life as you call upon the Holy Spirit to come, Lord, you live in me. Help me to overcome my anger. Help me to overcome my, my thought life. Help me to overcome my words. Help me to overcome my greed. Help me to overcome my self-centeredness. Help me to overcome whatever it is, my pride in all these things. So the fundamentals are important. And a wait a minute, back up. So look at the first one again. Groups which claim to be harmony with Christianity, but come along and they deny one of these things. They deny that either Jesus is God, or they deny that he died on the cross, or they deny that he rose from the dead. That's, that's an important thing that we see in cults. Look at the next one. Generally, they follow the instruction of one individual who dictates false teaching. So we, it's not always the case that it's one, but by and large, most of the time, there's one loose screw that's just messed up a bunch of people. And we see that, and we're going to see that tonight. Look at the next one. Counterfeit gospel. So we're talking about cults and counterfeit gospels, and very often they go together. But look at this. A fraudulent imitation of the gospel that deceives people, that draws them away from truth of salvation in Christ. This is very prevalent all around us. This morning, or this evening, keep, let's go over to page 51, and where we're going to look. Last week we looked at Mormons. Um, we recognize that Mormons need our witness, they need our words of truth because they do not have a gospel of salvation in Christ. They have a gospel where, what, what are some of the things that surprised you that were true about Mormonism that you learned last week? What are some basic things maybe that were there or maybe something that surprised you? What are some things we talked about about Mormonism? Say that again. A man became God. So, so this, this spirit man becomes a God, is the idea. And that each person, that, that's who Jesus was, he was a spirit who, be, or excuse me, a man, an exalted man who would become God. They would say he wasn't God originally. And that all of you can hope one day to be like Jesus and that you too can become a God. 
very clear that that's one of the things that Mormonism teaches. What else? Okay, three levels of heaven, different, different levels of heaven for different um, levels of whether you're a Mormon or whether you're a Christian or whether you're, you're not just a good moral person or whether you're one who rejects. And if you're one who rejects, another thing that they would say is there that they would believe in annihilationism um, or that you go out of existence. So, Colvin, what did you say? Okay, the, 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 there's, so there's practices that we would say, wow, here, this person has died, and now we're going to baptize them. We're, we're going to, and th that would somehow bring about uh, their salvation or secure their place in one of the three heavens. What else? Yes. Okay, so they reject the Trinity. They reject Father, Son, and Spirit in one. They, they reject the Trinity. Um, what else? Say that again? Yeah, thousands of gods, ultimately, um, is the picture that is there. Um, so there's, there's things there that we would, we would say any of these things that go against basic fundamental Christian doctrines. I mean, let's also, Colvin had mentioned before, the, one of the fundamentals of our faith as Christians is that the Bible is the basis of what we believe. It's not just how we feel. It's not just something that somebody else said. But we, we have his word that becomes what we call the plumb line. A plumb line is if we wanted to see if this pulpit was straight up and down, you could hold a, a weight on a string. And the weight on that string is going to be straight. And it's going to go straight down, right? And you could just hold it here next to the pulpit. And you can see... If the pulpit is a little turned sideways, because the plumb line is because of gravity is going to be straight and it's going to be headed straight down, and we could hold it there next to it. You could look at the pulpit and you can see you can do that with a wall. You can see if a wall is straight by holding a plumb line there. The scripture is the plumb line for us. The scripture is the standard by which we by which we see if everything else is straight. Does that make sense? So the plumb line of scripture is the picture that God's word is what dictates whether we're right or whether we're wrong, whether we're true, whether we're not true, and all those things. So in Mormonism, what were the things that you remember? There were a few of them, and you may have it in your notes. What were the things that they say dictate their beliefs? Thank you. The Book of Mormon. What else? Pearl of Great Price. What else? Another, so the idea of it being another testament of Jesus Christ. What else? The current president of the Mormon church. Can, that's very similar to Roman Catholicism, we'll see. The, the Pope can speak ex cathedra, and that is to be, um, that is to be a new word or a correction. And then also they say, oh yeah, the Bible too. Um, but not the way you have it, but the Bible. Um, and so the, the New Testament, they would say, was also one of those. But you see, there's a big problem with all of that in that they're elevating all of these other things over Scripture. And that's, that's where we get off. That's where we, I mean, when you, when you start to see Joseph Smith and he's claiming to have these visions and he's claiming to have translated through an angel these plates that have become the Scriptures. And all of this in the 1830s, I mean, all of this is new all this is new, and um, we, we, we see that a lot of momentum, however that got going, a lot of momentum got there, and then before you know it, many, many people are deceived by someone's new ideas. So this evening, we're going to take just a few minutes and look at Jehovah's Witnesses, and let's um, get, warm up your pen there on page 51 and let's fly. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, who are Jehovah's Witnesses? They're followers of God who believe that Jehovah is God's one true name. So there's, there's no other name. This is why they would call themselves Jehovah Witnesses. They are the ones who testify of Jehovah. It's begun by Charles Taze Russell in 1872, circle 1872. Just want you to notice that. So um, take a look there, 1872. Growing up in the church, he had great difficulty with the doctrines of the Trinity and hell. He didn't understand the Trinity and he thought hell was terrible. Look at the next part. At 18, he organized a Bible study class, a Bible class in Pittsburgh during the Bible student movement of the 1870s and began teaching his view of these doctrines. So he was underlined the part where it says teaching his view 
of these doctrines. That was the problem. So it was good that people were studying the Bible, but he started with the Bible and he started teaching his views concerning Trinity and hell. 1879, he began co-publishing his teachings in the Herald of the Morning magazine. So he started off with a magazine. We will see how important that was. In 1884, so just five years later, he controlled the publishing and renamed the magazine the what? The Watchtower. The Watchtower. And it was called then the Watchtower Announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. And it was founded by Zion's Watchtower Tract Society. And now it's known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now this is amazing. At first, the circulation of the first edition of the Watchtower magazine was 6,000 copies per month. And so this is back in the late 1800s. Listen to this. Today, the publishing complex in Brooklyn, New York, their current headquarters, produces 100,000 books and 800,000 copies of its magazines per day. Per day. So they produce 100,000 books and 800,000 magazines per day. Here it is. They claim to have a circulation of 42 million copies of each issue of the Watchtower magazine. And that makes it the magazine that is the largest publication magazine in the world is the Watchtower magazine. The second one that you've probably also seen, circle the word Watchtower there and then circle the word Awake. I um, want you to just be aware of those, really know about those. The second one is Awake, with a circulation of 41 million copies for each, wish, each issue. These are the largest two um, publications um, sent out each month in the world. Now, many of you have seen Jehovah's Witness materials placed all around town. You've seen them in hotel lobbies. You've seen them in doctor's offices. You've seen them over at Tire Kingdom. You've seen them, you, you, you name it. Okay, on your front door. Um, but wherever they can, wherever they can find someone who will let them, they will put up a, you know, a whole bookstall or they'll put up a whole rack. And it's very interesting. If you look at the titles of the rack, it's things like Finding True Life. In the, excuse me, Is the Bible Relevant Today? Um, how about this? The way of happiness, finding the way to happiness. In fact, if you go to their website and you begin to look at their website, you find these appealing messages, how to be truthful, how to be honest, how to save your finances, how to be frugal, how to, there, there's many different things that have to do with moral values. Um, talking about your moral behavior a great deal about what you do, how to build more relationships, how to have better friends, how to do, how to do many of these different things, how to have a happy home. Things that many people would say, well, I want that. I would like that. And there's nothing wrong with those things except that as they continue to do this, we're going to see what they leave out in the midst of what we will call their moralism. Um, Russell claimed that the Bible could only be understood according to his interpretations. He claimed that the Bible could only be understood according to his pulpit. I hope you put a line out there that says a cult exclamation point. So that, remember what our definition of a cult is that there's somebody who says, hey, this is the way it works. So very quick, after Russell's death in 1916, Joseph Franklin Rutherford became president of the Watchtower uh, society in 1931, Rutherford changed the name of the organization to Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they believe that they are the only pure religion interpreting the Bible as the early Christians did before it was corrupted in the third and fourth centuries, they would say. They are known for their ministry. Now, now think about this. What, when you think of Jehovah's Witnesses, what do you think of? With Mormons, you think of a bicycle and a guy with a white shirt and a name tag, right? What do you think of when you think of Jehovah's Witnesses? Here they come. Saturday morning, 9.30, right on time. Okay, so there they go. A couple hours um, in the morning. So door-to-door -door visits and the distribution of literature. They always have a magazine. 
you, you got a problem? Oh, we got a magazine for that. And they pull one out. Oh, we got a pamphlet for that. Oh, we got a track for that. It's kind of like our mini books in the, uh, in the bookstore, right? Oh, we got one for that. I mean, you know, it's, it's very often that's kind of the idea. But this is, they are known for door-to-door -door visits, and they are known for their literature. They refer to their place of worship as a kingdom hall, as a kingdom hall. So they would say this is, you know, the kingdom of God hall, uh, distingu distinguishing themselves from a church. Unique perspectives. Um, and here's some interesting things that some of you may know or maybe you don't know. They do not celebrate Christmas or Easter since Jesus' death is what saves. They would say you, you shouldn't celebrate either one of those two things. Do not celebrate birthdays because such celebrations have pagan roots. Um, they do not accept blood transfusions because they believe the Bible prohibits ingesting blood. Um, you know, there's obviously places in the Old Testament law that says do not drink the blood of an animal um, or something. And so this has been seen as an ingestion of that. Um, and then, of course, there's been lawsuits and law cases and there's been uh, arrests and various other things at different times when different states took different positions on whether or not you could refuse life-saving blood transfusion. Look at the next part here. Um, clergy are unpaid. Wow, poor guys. And tithing is not practiced. Great people, right? I'd say that sounds great to me, right? Look at the next part. Believe that Jesus is the king of God's kingdom and that he began ruling in 1914. So um, very specifically in 1914. Interesting that that happened to be when these guys were writing all these things and just a few years after they got going. Where do they get that from? Look at page 52 at the bottom. Revelation 12, 6 and 14. And this is a quote. This is a quote from the JW.org website. So uh, this is their official website. Just like the Morgan, Mormons, they have an official website. So um, Baptists don't have an official website. You know, Presbyterians don't have an official website. There may be denominations that have one, but these are their cult. These are their religious order that has this. Revelation 12, 6, 14 indicates that three and a half times equal 1,260 days that seven times would therefore last twice as long or 2,520 days. But the original Gentiles na nations did not stop trampling on God's rulership as a mere, a, a mere 2,552 days, uh, or excuse me, 2,520 days after Jerusalem's fall. Evidently then this prophecy covers a much longer period of time. On the basis of Numbers 14, 13 and Ezekiel 4, 6, which speak of a day for a year, the seven times would cover 2,520 years and 2,520 years would begin in October 607 BCE when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians and the Davidic king was taken off his throne. The period ended in October of 1914. At that time, the appointed times of the nations ended and Jesus Christ was installed as God's heavenly king. Psalm 2 and Daniel 7, just as Jesus predicted, his presence as, heaven, as heavenly king would be marked by dramatic world developments, war, famine, earthquakes, pestilences, and so forth. Such developments bear power, powerful testimony to the fact that 1914 indeed marked the birth of God's heavenly kingdom and the beginning of the last days of his present wicked system of things. So, just like so many other groups and even groups within Christianity that begin date naming and begin date claiming many of these things, they go into elaborate views of history and very specific views of certain events in history and then benchmark off of those as, as the key signs and the key developments um, for certain prophecies. And then they start to name those things. It's just interesting how that typically happens right around the term, the time that those people are alive and writing those things about their own beliefs. They also believe, this is another unique perspective, they also believe that only 1,400, excuse me, 144,000 people will be resurrected to live with Jehovah in heaven and rule with Jesus in his kingdom. They believe that God will raise billions from the dead and many who are now living will be saved. Today, there's over 8 million members of the Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide, and this includes 1.2 million in the United States. So what do they believe? 
And again, they have a website. You notice this here, and there's several of these that are quotes off their website. So it's important for us to look at what they say they believe officially. They would say, as Jehovah's Witnesses, we strive to adhere to the form of Christianity that Jesus taught and his apostles practiced. Well, you'd say, that's simple enough. That's good. That's, that, what's wrong with that? Well, if that's where they stayed, it would probably be okay, but that's not where they stay. What do they believe about God? About God, God's one true name is Jehovah. Now, this is interesting. They, we, they would say that we worship the one true almighty God, the creator, whose name is Jehovah. And they take a couple of quotes there. The word Jehovah is what we translate into English as the Lord. And as we look at the Lord, that is used over 6,000 times in the Bible. So the word the Lord is used as of Jehovah. Notice this. The Trinity, they would say, is unbiblical. So when you're looking at their beliefs about God, they would say the Trinity is unbiblical. The word Trinity is not used in the Bible. So there is one God, they would say, Jesus, this is so important, Jesus was created as a lesser God. And this is one of the key departures that they have from Christianity. And the Holy Spirit is a force, not a person. So the Holy Spirit is a force. It's not a person of the Trinity. It doesn't get a he, it gets an it. And we talked about that in the first part of our study as we were looking at the one true God. Bottom of page 53, what about scripture and authority? What do they believe about that? Look at the quote at the bottom. We recognize the Bible as God's inspired message to humans. And then they go, and in page 54 at the top, they use what is called, fill it in, the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. And it was published in 1961. So where does that come from? Well, here's the deal. Whenever you see one of these, and this one was found in one of our pews. So just like you all sometimes leave your Bible around and somebody picks it up and it goes to lost and found. When I arrived at this church, I went through the lost and found cabinets over there and I found two of these um, in the stacks. And I also found a book of Mormon in the stacks. Now, I'm very excited that people are bringing this stuff and leaving it here so we can safely take care of it. Um, and maybe they go into the bookstore and they buy the real thing, hopefully. But in case if you're wondering, are these cults around us? People are coming out of these cults or have been affected by these cults and they're showing up at church and they're forgetting their Bible or their Book of Mormon here in the, and you're right, Miss Faye, I agree. They, they, they welcome to leave it. But notice this. What is this? 1961, they retranslated the Bible instead of wanting to continually defend their views on a few key things, they simply modified their Bible so they didn't have an argument. They would say, oh, well, our scripture is more accurate than your scripture. And so they would change it. And we're going to see one of the key examples of that in the very next line that's right here. In the beginning, this is John 1.1. 1, 1. This is the first passage that I preached at Sheridan Hills when I came back as pastor. Notice what it says here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Would you circle the letter A in front of God? They put an article an indefinite article in front of the word God because they do not believe that Jesus is God. And so their, their own translation right there, John 1.1, 1, 1, is 100% corrupted in that regard. Look about, so that's just some of the things that they would believe about man, about God. What about man? What do they believe about man? Man has no immaterial soul. He doesn't have a soul. The soul is simply the life force within a person which ceases to exist at death. And JW.org says the soul then is the entire creature, not something inside that survives the death of the body. The Bible makes very clear that that is not true. That you have a soul that survives the, the death of this body. Notice the next part here. What do they believe about Jesus? And this is very important. We kind of touched on it already a little bit. We follow the teaching and examples of Jesus Christ and honor him as Savior and as, son, uh, as the Son of God. 
Thus, we are Christians. However, we have learned from the Bible that Jesus is not Almighty God. Underline that. That Jesus is not Almighty God. And that there is no scriptural basis for Trinity doctrine. And so, they, they come directly out and say, we reject Jesus being God. Um, they would say this, that Jesus was created as, as the archangel Michael before the world existed. So he was created as Michael, and he was a man and a lesser God. Notice jw.org, what it says. The first human that God created, Adam, is called a son of God. Similarly, the Bible teaches that Jesus was created by God, so Jesus is also called a son of God. Um, he died on a simple stake, they would say, not on a cross. He, his resurrection was spiritual. It was not physical. So the second big thing that they deny, not only was, was that Jesus was God, but they deny the resurrection. Um, look at the last part there. His second coming occurred spiritually and invisibly in 1914. So they're saying he's already come back, and we are now in his kingdom. So... Friends, um, the kingdom is going to get a whole lot better than it is right now since 1914, over the last 105 years. So um, look at the next part. Bottom of page 54, about salvation. What do they believe about salvation? They would say ransom through Jesus' death. Now, there's some aspect of that that we would agree with, that we are ransomed by Christ, that he is paid for our sins. Notice here it says, how, how did Jehovah, Jehovah provide ransom? Underline this. He sent one of his perfect spirit sons to the earth. What does John 3.16 say? Very carefully, John 3.16 says, For God, let's say it out loud together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So very clearly, John 3.16 says he gave his only begotten son. And here he says, um, we, we specifically deny that. And that's from the ransom, God's greatest gift. That's one of their key books. Um, requirements of eternal life. Well, they would say faith in Jesus, but they would also say identification with Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, just understand that faith in Jesus, what does that mean to them? They're not, they're not depending upon him as the perfect sacrifice for your sins. They're, they're saying that he's one of many sacrifices, but, but that's a key issue. But look at the next part there. Identification with Jehovah's Witnesses. To benefit from Jesus' sacrifice, people must not only exercise faith in Jesus, but also must change their course of life and get baptized. And their baptism is in reference to the Jehovah's Witness Hall of Faith. Look at the next part. Obedience to Jehovah's Witnesses teachings. Now, if you, if you really look at Jehovah's Witness teachings, there is a great deal of emphasis not put upon theological doctrine so much as there is put on how you're living and what teaching are you exemplifying in your obedience to life. So that they, and I'm just going to have you right out there to the side, works-based salvation. They fundamentally disagree with what we say Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 so clearly says. They completely twist Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But anyways, go to the next part. What do they say about judgment and eternity? Hell is not a place of eternal suffering, but the common grave for all people. So they they confuse some of, the, some of the words for death in the Old Testament and in a couple places in the New Testament as with the grave alone. Secondly, the wicked are annihilated, not punished forever. So they're, they're completely, the soul is, ceases to exist. Look what it says there in their quote. People who die pass out of existence. They do not suffer in a fiery hell of tor torment. God will bring billions back from death by means of resurrection. However, those who refuse to learn God's ways are being raised to a life that will be destroyed forever with no hope of resurrection. So they deny the many places where the Lord Jesus, as well as the Apostle Paul, and throughout the Old Testament, we see a very real, literal hell that is eternal. 
May not be something that you like to think about, may not be something that we can fully grasp, but it is the reality of what God's word says. And so we come and we begin to see how God's glory is seen even in the reality of hell. Notice the next part, page 55 at the bottom, two peoples of God. So there's two classes within Jehovah's Witnesses. There is the anointed class. So the anointed class is that 144,000 people who live in heaven and will rule with Christ. And we see that in their statement that is there. But down at the bottom of page 55, you see that there's other sheep. And these are all other believers in God. Will live forever on a paradise earth. And so that's except for those who reject God and are wicked. But... All of this sounds something, you know, there's, there's different aspects of this that sound Christian, but there's things that we pointed out that obviously don't. But here's the thing that we have to remember. In all of these beliefs that we've just studied, it is based upon one man's interpretation of the Bible. And this is where it becomes a cult. When he comes to the scripture and he looks at scripture and he twists it and he turns it and he says, if you want to be saved, you have to understand the scripture based upon my interpretation, not based upon 2,000 years of basic Christian belief. You see, listen, the word orthodoxy is a good word, not talking about the Greek Orthodox Church. The word orthodoxy means the, the idea of those truths that the church has held, and I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic Church, I'm talking about the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true church of Christ, has held for these years, since the first century. And so we want to always look through Christian history carefully, see what doctrines the script, the, the, the true church has held onto, and we don't want to make up new doctrines. It's a dangerous thing when people start making up new stuff. What is the safe thing to do is to keep going back to the scripture and going back to the basic understandings of the scripture based upon what we see happen in the first and second, especially the first two centuries where they're, they're having councils together and say, what did Matthew mean? What did Mark mean? What did the apostle Paul mean? What did Jesus mean when he was talking about himself? Who is Christ? Those initial Councils were incredibly important. And what is so interesting is, is that those initial councils, there were several of them, they came up with the same conclusion every time. Jesus is God. The Trinity is clearly in Scripture. That is not a new doctrine. Just because the Word doesn't appear there doesn't mean that this is not, that this not the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is God, and Jesus is God. And salvation only comes through faith in him. Amen. It's not in everything else. It's not in what somebody pays. It's not in what, you know, eventually the, the Catholic Church comes along and says, well, you can buy. You can buy your way in. And, and we've studied that as, the, as we've looked at the Reformation. We, we've said, wait a minute, that's not, that's not true soteriology. That's not a true way to salvation. It is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very basic reality for us. How do we share the gospel with Jehovah's Witnesses? How do we do that? Number one, we need to pray in the Spirit. We need to be careful to be people of prayer. We need to recognize that you cannot argue a Jehovah's Witness into faith. There's many, many Christians who have sought to argue them into faith. If I, I'm going to beat them at their argument. They have carefully crafted arguments, very similar to Mormons very often. And the ones who are knocking on the door, they know the top five things that are, coming, are going to come out of a nominal Christian's mouth, a basic Christian's mouth that doesn't really know. And, and they have very clever ways to take you and take you even to a passage of Scripture that they want to turn on its head um, for you. So, and they, they want to get in an argument. They love to be able to argue, and that, that, that's a very wonderful way for them to feel better about their basic belief. But... We need to recognize that Jehovah's Witnesses aren't going to be won to Christ through an argument um, in itself. It really begins, just like everything that God does, it begins by His Spirit and His work. Um, and you can look at Ephesians chapter 6, 
um, verses 12 through 20 shows that the power that is, that, is being, that is holding Jehovah's Witnesses in deception is a very real, wicked, dark power that holds them, keeping them, blinding them from seeing who Jesus really is. And that is, that is a very powerful thing. And the only way that that is overcome is through the Spirit of Christ. The second thing that we should do is to discuss Scripture. To always point to Scripture. Scripture is what is going to be used to unseat their false belief. Using Scripture is what will cause them to go, ooh, and that, this is what the Holy Spirit begins to do. So God's Spirit comes and He uses His Word. There are three things that God uses in our witnessing. It's you, it's His Spirit, and it's His Word. Those three things have to work together. You, His Spirit, and His Word. And then you begin to see, as you share Scripture in His Spirit, empowers that scripture through you that the false beliefs begin to be shown. Look what Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it's better than any Jehovah's Witness argument or Mormon argument or even your own argument. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, in discerning the thoughts and in the intentions of of the heart. You see, God's word can go in and do what you can't do in the heart of a Jehovah's Witness. Even though they have been galvanized, even though they have been prepared to deal with your common arguments back as a Christian, the word of God is the thing that is going to unseat them the best. And so don't get in arguments about whether Jesus was, was, was God in, in the rational arguments of that or whether their hall is the only thing or even their history, though I do like to talk about their history with them and I challenge them with them on those points. The key issue, though, is presenting Scripture to them. Um, Notice what it says in Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, this is speaking of Jesus, interpreted to them all the scriptures concerning the things concerning himself. So Jesus was presenting scripture to those disciples that were walking after the resurrection on the road to Emmaus, and he went to the scriptures himself. And so when you're, when you're dealing with, their, with the scripture issue, read it and discuss it with them personally. You see that at the bottom of the page. Um, and this is where we get in trouble sometimes. I'm going to just be real honest with you. This is our family room. I'm going to get on to us a little bit. Very often, we don't know the Bible well enough to have an intelligent conversation with these folks. You say, well, Pastor, I'm here on Wednesday night. I know, but we need to spend time in God's word and not just stare at it, but to study it and to read it, meditate on it, and to take it apart. It can, it can survive your taking it apart. And we, we, need to, we need to become familiar with his word enough. We need to read his word enough that when we get in discussions with them, that scripture comes out of our mouth. And that when they say things that are not correct, we say, no, wait a minute. But the Bible says, but the Bible says, but the Bible says. And that doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't do any good to sleep with your head on it or to sit there and look at it. Or to a moto, we, we need to read it, study it. You say, well, I, I don't read hardly at all. Well, if you don't read hardly at all, make sure that the Bible is the thing that you do read. I mean, we, we live in a country that for a few hundred years, people learned to read by reading the Bible. They didn't have other books to read. Um, I want to encourage you to take time in God's Word. Look what it says at the bottom of page 56. 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God, not to man, but to God as an approved, a wor as one approved, a worker who needs, has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. You can do that. That's exactly what God has called us to do. Look at the top of page 57. We need to discuss scripture with them and discuss it mutually, mutually with them. But as we do that, we want to do that 
the scriptures relating to God. So these are the scriptures about who God is. They're confused about who God is. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created all things. And this is going to go somewhere here real quick. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. So God appears to Abraham, calling Abraham to recognize, recognize that they need to start to understand and see who God is. Um, look at the next part. Not only discuss with them and show them who God is based upon the scriptures, but also discuss what does the scripture say about salvation? What is salvation? And this is Ephesians chapter 2, 8. This is a key passage for you to, to share with them. And amazingly, some of them have never really looked at this. Look what it says, though. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That This is not your own doing. It is the gift of of God. You see, any religion and any cult that, that elevates one's obedience over the grace of God as the means of salvation, these words are liberating words to those people because they can't do it. They can't be good enough for God. They're trying and they're working and they're comparing themselves to the the other lady who did two more streets every Saturday than she did. Or the other guy who knows more Jehovah's Witness verses and arguments than he does. Or the other guy who doesn't seem to look at pornography. And sometimes he looks at pornography and he's sitting there and he's going, how does that guy, he's pure and I'm not. And, and suddenly you're comparing yourself to everybody else. And it's, it's all about your works. And so this is a key aspect for us to look at what, the God, what God's word truly says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. There, there are some that when that finally sinks into them, when they've heard the 10th Baptist person pull them into their living room and sit them down and say, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's that not of yourselves. It's, it, verse 9 says, it's not as a result of works, so that no man can boast. You cannot boast about salvation. It is the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. And you see, very often when they hear that, they've been programmed to say, you are an easy believism. Do whatever you want. Just say that you believe. And you look at them and say, I absolutely reject what you just said. I don't think that. I don't think in the terms of easy believism, say a prayer and then I'm simply saved in this regard. That, that, is, that is not what saves me is this idea of, of an easy and, and costless salvation. No, the greatest cost of all is the cost of Christ who paid for my sins and for whom I am in bondage to forever. For by grace I am saved through faith in him. Um, not only do we continue on in, in emphasizing salvation, but also to talk with them on eternity, to discuss eternity um, in this. And there's several passages here that can refute their view about, um, about their rejection of hell. Um, these make very clear that there is a very real hell and that, that it is a very powerful place of real torment and, and that this is a, a reality on page 58. Um, what about the state of believers looking at them and saying who are true Christians and who are not? And what is the thing that opens the door of heaven and that which does not? Bottom of page 58, fill in the word. Talk with them about the scriptures in context. What they will do is they will pull the scriptures out of context. So that's what it means here, in context. You want to discuss scripture, scripture with them in context. They, that's what they, that's what they tend to do is pull things out of context. Where do they get the 144,000 thing? Look at the next passage, Revelation chapter seven, verses one through eight. They fundamentally misunderstand a very simple thing in Revelation seven through eight. Um, and then they don't keep reading. That's the problem. Um, notice here what it says in the middle of that passage, it says, and I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe, sons of 
Israel, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from Reuben. He goes through the 12 tribes. But if you keep reading, look at the next section, Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After this, I looked and behold, what does it say? A great that what? From every nation. A great multitude, underline that, that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to who? Our God. Our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, it's not in ourselves. Salvation does not belong to us. It doesn't belong to anyone else. This is what even what we looked at Sunday, is that God was showing through Hosea, you cannot save yourself. Even through going through all of the punishments um, that God would bring upon them to turn them back to themselves, they still would not turn back to them. Sunday morning when we looked at that, the final part of that passage in Hosea chapter 2, it says, and God took the, mouth, the name of Baal out of their mouth, and God put his name in their mouth. God did the work. God changed their heart. God turned them to himself. The beautiful picture of the sovereignty of God and our salvation. And, and what do we do with that? We just say, praise God. Thank you. I don't know why you did that. Thank you. Focus on God as Jehovah in the scriptures. And the fact that he is the Lord 6,000 times in the scripture. We see this beautiful picture of who he is. Um, and his name not distorted as they would distort and reject the others. Now, I want, I want to give you over these, in page 60 and 61, um, I, I think that this is a really helpful thing. This is one of those things that if you're going to engage and engage with them based upon the scripture, this is a great way to do it. But um, focus on Jesus as God. Put a big circle around that statement at the top of page 60. At the top of page 60, focus on Jesus as God. Um, that is a good thing to focus on them and, with. And I want you to notice what it says here. At the top is John 1.1. 1, 1, and this is the true scripture, not their false translation. Look what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now look at their translation. Look what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, circle the letter A. You already did that in another place. But notice after that that it says John 1.1, 1, 1, New World Translation. So this is their New World Translation where it says A God. Now, if you even gave them John 1.1, 1, 1, you could force them to deal with John 1.3. And notice what it says. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now look at their translation in John 1, 3. All things came into existence through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. You can say, no problem. That's an acceptable translation. It may not be word for word in the Koine Greek, but that's an acceptable translation. So, you've just given them one, John chapter 1 and verse 3. Well, let's see what that means. It's talking about everything that exists. And you can do this on a napkin in your, in, in your house. You can grab a little piece of paper and you, you can say, hey, let's just, let's just have a conversation here about John 1, 3. And John 1, 3 says that everything that exists let, let's just say that it's in this box. This little box represents everything that exists. And on one side of the box, we put all things that never came into being. Think about that. All thing, and this is the box below it, on page 60. And this is already written out for you. All things that never came into being. You say, okay, so what are the things that never came into being? The only thing that never came into being because it always existed was God. To go on to the next thing there. The, you know, who, is, who and what is in this? There's, there's only one thing that didn't ever not exist. That's God. Well, let's think about the things that come into being. All things that came into being. 
Well, that would be all created things. And so if we go back and we look at John 1, 3, according to John 1, 3, all created things came into being through Jesus. That's what they recognize. They are saying that Jesus is the word of John 1, 1. And they are recognizing that all things came into being through him. So Jesus can't create himself. What you're saying to them is, you're rejecting Jesus as God, but we are recognizing that everything that came into being came into being through Jesus. So how can you say that Jesus isn't God? Jesus is God. And all things came in through him. Now, what's interesting, flip the page on page 62. If you write that out and you kind of show it to them and show them that arrow that's there, all things that were created were created through Jesus. They, they admit that with you, John 1, 3. Um, one suggestion is to take out a quarter and take your little napkin there where you've just drawn this out and say, if everything exists into one of these two categories and this coin represents Christ, where does he go? Which box does he go in? And they're going to sit there and they're going to look at that and they're going to, they're going to want to put him on the right-hand side of the box, that it's all the created things. But then they go back and they read John 1, 3, and they go, I can't put him there because he can't create himself. You see, there's a big difference with Jesus coming into the world as God through Mary, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that he emptied himself and he comes and he joins us. And he, he willingly, the second person of the Trinity, comes and joins us for a very particular purpose, to pay for the sins of the world. So what you do is you place the coin where Jesus belongs, and then you, you simply go back and you look at the difference, and you, you highlight that picture of John 1, 3, that he indeed is the one who created all things. Look there in the middle of page 63 where it says, if Jesus caused all things, excuse me, if Jesus caused all created things to come into existence, then he must have existed before all created things came into existence. Therefore, the word could not have been created. In other words, if Jesus created everything that has come into being and Jesus also came into being, as Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses contend, then that would mean Jesus created himself. He would have to exist as a creator before he, create, he existed as a created thing, which is impossible. Therefore, Jesus cannot, can't be placed in the square labeled all things that came into being. If Jesus can't be placed on the right side, with created things, then he must go on the left with uncreated things, identifying Jesus as the uncreated creator. Therefore, underline it, Jesus is God. And this is exactly what Jesus said in John 10, verse 30, when he said, I and the Father are one. He also said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus is just making very clear that he is God. Now, um, I want you to also notice here on 63 that they don't have the only corner on the literature market. I know that they produce a lot of literature, but we can produce literature too. And we do have literature. We have tracts and we have books. And some of them are readers. And some books have been written for Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, but the best thing to give them is, script, is um, really a true translation of the Bible and ask them to start looking at the differences. Um, there's also pamphlets and various other things that have been written to help them to evaluate that and to work through um, their beliefs. One of the things that I love to do in that, and I haven't seen a piece of literature lately that deals with their history, but one of the things that I always harp on with Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or many other sects is this. Have you, have you really studied the beginning of your movement? Have you really studied where your movement came from? Do you really know from historical sources, both inside your movement, listen to this, and what was written from the outside of your movement about the history of your movement? 
And most of them will say, well, no. And in fact, there's many Jehovah's Witnesses that would say, we're not allowed to read that. And the reason that they're told that they may not read that and that they can be excommunicated if they do read that is because that is what will reveal the falsehoods that they believe. So um, I've often said to them, as they want to give me something, if I have an appropriate uh, brochure or pamphlet or something that deals with it, I'll say, I will read yours if you will read mine. And they will, they will take back their brochure and they will say, I'm not going to read yours. When that happens, I say, is there a problem here? I mean, am I just dumb or is there a problem with the fact that I'm willing to read your stuff, but you're not willing to read mine? Um, you know, the truth doesn't need to be afraid of anything. You can, just, you can just hold on to the truth. You keep on going with the truth. We don't need to be afraid. I, here's a New World Translation. And I would say to you, you know, if you get a bee in your bonnet to reach... Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, read the New World Translation. Read the whole, I used to read the Quran a lot. Marcy said, you just, you, man, you get mean when you read the Quran. And I mean, <laughs> it's, it's demonic. I mean, it's seriously demonic. Um, and she, she was like, please don't read that thing anymore. But the fact of the matter is, the truth of Christ is steadfast, immovable. And it is bulletproof in every way. You keep holding on to the truth. You keep declaring the truth. You keep studying the truth and knowing the truth. And, and you can become steadfast in such a way that you can, you can wade into other beliefs and say, this is false. And I can show you where it's false. Now, I, I believe that there are many Jehovah's Witnesses that when they start to realize that they are being told not to read something because um, they have something to be afraid of, I believe that some of them who are true seekers of the truth will begin to see the great freedom and joy that there is in Christ in the true gospel. So I want to challenge you with that. Notice the last one that is here and fill this in. Be sure to show them love. It will not help the cause of the gospel for Gordon or for Adrian or Fred or Robert or Julie. It doesn't help if we get mad at them. And I know that their positions can be infuriating when they are so not willing to recognize what you're saying. But it doesn't help to get angry with them. In fact, they may leave going, look at that, I suffered for my faith. I must really be one of the 144. I have endured hardship. I must really be one of the 144,000 um, because I have just been mistreated by this Baptist deacon or this Baptist lady. Um, it doesn't help to get mad at them. Love them in the truth. Pray for them um, and seek to care for them. 